Hey, Shiva, how are you doing? Hey, Nicole. I am really just always happy when we get to meet to talk about uh, wonderful, meaningful things on Meaningful Medicine. And I'm really excited about both the topic that we're talking about today and also our very special guest. And I'm also thinking about you, Nicole. You've been under a lot of stress lately. I want to know how you're doing. I'm doing good. You know, uh, podcasting and intern year doesn't always mix, but <laughs> uh, definitely doing the best I can working through it and definitely having a ball figuring this out. And it's a definitely a fun adventure. So happy to be on on this ride with you. It is. Me too, Nicole. I am too. And we're going to talk today about uh, motherhood in medicine. And I wanted to think about it with you as we were um, just before we popped on. It's such an important topic. It's not theoretical. It's very real. Uh, it's 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 part of your life. Um, it's part of the thinking of every female body and, and really every young couple, if they're a couple right now, um, as they're navigating life. And also it's especially difficult as you're navigating medical school and residency because it's in the way of life uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and it doesn't make it, residency and, it, and medical education don't make much space at all for anything other than uh, you know being a student and a resident, let alone being a parent, being a mother or a father. So I, I just think it's such an important one. And as I mentor young people in school uh, and in residency, it's a big topic, it comes up a lot. And we were talking about that before. And thinking about how how relevant it is for you and the and your friends right now. I totally agree. We on a previous podcast uh, talked to one of my previous medical school classmates about family planning in medicine. I definitely think as a female body individual, a lot of us are under a bit of stress in terms of timing and really trying to think about how we can fit life into this track that is medicine. Depending on what specialty you go into, residency can be anywhere from three to seven, eight years, and that doesn't include fellowship. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us, me personally, I'm in my late 20s, a lot of us are really thinking about, you know, when do we fit in parenthood in this journey of medicine? And so I'm glad we get to talk to someone today to give us a little bit of insight in what her journey is with motherhood and medicine. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Andrea Tooley. She is a assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, where she also serves as the associate residency program director. Dr. Tooley specializes in oculofacial plastic surgery and is the American Academy of Young Ophthalmologists committee chair. Today, she shares her experience in training and beyond and shares her experience juggling her career and two small children through social media and her blog. Welcome, Dr. Tooley. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. We're so happy to have you here, Dr. Tooley, and really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, we do like to start every one of our episodes the same way. We like to ask our guests if you could, in short, share a meaningful moment from sometime early on in your life or early on in your training that was particularly formative or a defining kind of experience. Could you share that with us? Yeah, absolutely. I have, I'll, I'll be brief. I have two really meaningful moments. Um, one I, I've shared many times before, but this, is, this um, absolutely set me on my path where I am today. I was in high school. I was a pre-med student. Well, not even pre-med because I was in high school, but I, I thought maybe I would want to go into medicine and I ended up meeting someone who worked for a nonprofit called Orbis International. And Orbis is an ophthalmology group that flies into developing countries and does eye surgery on patients in need, and then also educates local um, ophthalmologists on new techniques. And uh, they have a strong education mission. And Orbis is incredible. They've they converted a DC-10 jet airplane into an operating room, and it's called the Flying Eye Hospital. And they fly around and they do eye surgeries on board this hospital. And when I met this, this person who traveled with Orbis and I went home and Googled Orbis and looked it up and I was 16 and it was an absolute defining moment. I said, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And I was laser focused on ophthalmology from that moment onward. I got to travel to Peru with Orbis when I was 17 and see my first eye surgeries, see the patients that we were helping and it really did it for me and and that's why I am where I am today it's unbelievable and then when I when I knew you were going to ask this question I started thinking about about 
in medical school? Like, what are some really meaningful moments? And I don't know, this one just stuck out to me. I remember the very first time that an ophthalmologist let me put a suture in an eye as a medical student. And um, I wasn't expecting it. And it's kind of the same. I flew airplanes in, in high school, and that's how I met the pilot for Orbis. But it's kind of the same as flying airplanes. You never know the first time you're going to get to solo. Your instructor doesn't tell you the day that you'll get to fly a plane by yourself. It always just happens. They they get out of the airplane and they say, okay, now you go take it on your own and then come back. And um, and my first time in the operating room was like that too. I didn't know that I'd have the opportunity to throw a stitch for the first time into an eye, but I did and I'll never forget it. And after the surgery was over, my mentor wrote on an index card exactly what we had done. And he put the sticker from the device that we implanted, a glaucoma device, you know, the little sticker that has the patient's implant. And he put the sticker on that note card and said, here you go. Um, now you'll remember this case. And I still have that index card. I keep it with me. And I, I came upon it maybe a couple weeks ago. And it's just moments like that in, in medicine, you'll never forget really formative memories. Um, and it's so special to be able to do what we do. Of course, there's a million patient memories and a million great moments like that. But mm. those are two that I that really stick with me. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I wonder if they don't tell you because they don't want you to like psych yourself out. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, I'd love to ask, were you always planning on having children? And when did you decide to have them on your medical journey? So I actually was very undecided about having kids. And I I want to be super honest about that. I My husband and I have been together since I was 18. Um, we got married my senior year of medical school. We got married right, right before med school graduation, but we've been engaged for a couple of years and we've been together forever. Um, and I was so laser focused on getting into ophthalmology residency, succeeding in med school, then succeeding in residency, doing all the things that we, we never really talked about having kids. And I think we thought maybe we might, but we had also had some very real discussions about maybe we wouldn't. And my husband, I'm super lucky that he was very supportive either way. And he kind of said, you know, whatever you want to do, like, I think he wanted to have kids, but he said, if you really don't, then that's okay. And uh, I'm an only child. I never, I didn't have cousins growing up. I never grew up around kids. And so I always felt very uncomfortable around kids. And I didn't have that maternal instinct. I didn't, Nobody told me that having kids and being a mom is the greatest thing in the whole world. Like, I didn't know that. Um, so for anyone listening, let me tell you that being a mom is the greatest thing and having children and being a parent in any way is, is absolutely the best thing I've ever done in my whole life. But I didn't know that when I was in my 20s. And so I was just focused on, on succeeding in, in medical training. And then halfway through my fellowship, I think it really kind of hit me all of a sudden, I started really thinking about, you know, I'm finally going to be done with training. We're, we're trainees for so long. And even though we're grownups, you know, quote, unquote, grownups, we're in our late 20s, early 30s. I feel like we still at least for me, I was very immature. I hadn't had a real job. I'd been a med student or a resident for so long. I hadn't been out in the real world. And so finally, as fellowship was wrapping up, I started to think, wow, I'm, I'm not going to be a trainee anymore. Life is going to change. And I started to think about what's actually important in life. What do I really want out of life? What really matters? And I talked to my husband a lot and, and we both really decided that family is the most important and family is what matters. And so right then I said, okay, well, I want to have kids. Let's do it. And um, so we had our daughter. My first year on faculty, no, my second year on faculty, um, right, right when I got back. So she was born in September of 2021, and um, it's been absolutely wonderful. And then three months after she was born, I got pregnant with my second child um, really fast. We, we knew we wanted kids, you know, kind of more kids right away, but we didn't think it would happen that fast, but it happened really fast. Um, and so ready or not, we had our second in September the following year. So we have two September babies. They're a year and two weeks apart. And so that's my son, Dawson. And so he's eight months now. 
and Tessa's 20 months. And I mean, it, they're, it's just the greatest thing I've ever done ever. And I never had female mentors or role models to tell me how important it is. And so I want to be that voice. If you don't have a female mentor in your life who's saying you can crush it at your career, you can get through medical training and, and having kids will still be the proudest moments of your life and what all your accomplishments, you know, having kids is still the best thing I've ever done. It's really cool. And I never thought I would feel that way. You know, I, I wasn't this maternal girl. They said that wasn't me, but now it is. <laughs> it is such a wonderful story, Dr. Tuli. And as, as you're sharing it, and I'm kind of thinking about you and your husband talking about this quite a lot and trying to come to this decision together. Um, I'm wondering if you had any fears. Uh, and I mean, I know the obvious ones, and please feel free to talk about the obvious ones, but also, um, could you talk a little bit about what you were most afraid of, um, about having a family while you were here you are in the early parts of your finishing your your fellowship and beginning as a as a new faculty what what is this most scary part about it that you thought about i think that i didn't want to have to take a step back in my career mm -hmm. i and a lot of this is the, these are hard and unfortunate truths that we're faced with as women and a lot of this, I think, is changing in medicine, and we have to be the voice to change this. But I was afraid that I would be overlooked for opportunities. I was afraid that I wouldn't be thought of as a great surgeon, or, you know, I, I just was worried that my role would change, or that people would say, oh, let, we are not going to ask her for this opportunity because she's probably so busy with her kids. Mm -hmm. Because that happens. And you hear about the, the trajectory of women in medicine who are succeeding, succeeding, crushing it, crushing it, crushing it. And then there's, there's this abrupt change where we don't see women in higher levels of medicine. We don't see as many senior authors that are women. We don't see as many chairs that are women, department chairs. We don't even see as many associate professors that are women. They're all assistant professors. And then there's this steep drop off. And as I've wrestled with wanting to quote unquote succeed or, or, you know, really get the full, full academic medicine, everything out of it, do research, publish, contribute to my field, be a great surgeon, really help my patients take on complex cases, like just, you know, dig into my career as much as I can. I, I think I really probably was afraid of motherhood taking away from that. And then on the flip side, I think we all feel this, you have this deep fear that you're not going to be there for your kids and you're not going to be a good mom. It's like, well, if I want to do all this other stuff, then I'm going to be a bad mom because I'm not going to, I'm going to miss all this stuff with my kids and I'm not going to be there for the important things or whatever, whatever. And gosh, I've wrestled with these thoughts so much because there's PC ways to say things. And then there's hard realities that we're all faced with. And we're held to an impossible standard where we have to crush it at work and then crush it at home. And we want to be eligible for every outstanding leadership position and every top of the top role. But then at the, on the same, in the same vein, we can't think less of women who say, you know what? None of that matters. I want to take a step back and be home with my kids. Because, you know, I, our, I said all this where we don't see as women as many women chairs. Well, do we need to? Maybe they don't want to be chairs. And these are all these thoughts that I'm wrestling with because now it's like, okay, I love my kids so much. Do I really want to be as engaged in work or do I want to cut back so that I can hang out with my kids more? And is that a bad thing? Should I feel bad about that? Does that mean that I'm not as good a doctor because maybe I'm not going to be associate professor as soon as I would have if I didn't have kids? Like these are all, they're such tough concepts that I wrestle with a lot. And you can't do it all. You have to decide what your priorities are. I think I've gone off on a huge, huge tangent. I clearly have many thoughts about this, Shiva. <laughs> it's but perfect. It's I, perfect. my biggest fears were were not succeeding at work and not succeeding at home. 
and and feeling unfulfilled because of those things Mm -hmm. when in the reality you might not have the same endpoint at work or at home that you thought you might have but I think how you feel about that changes Mm -hmm. you know like I don't care if I don't publish as many papers anymore I'm still publishing a ton of papers would I publish more papers if I didn't have kids probably but do I care no so I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. It's very hard. <laughs> I, yes, you do. I, that was perfectly said. That was perfectly said. I think you spoke the heart of a lot of moms, of a lot of moms in medicine. I think you really said it nicely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate how you went through the different thoughts that are going through your mind. And part of me kind of wonders, you know, female body individuals, yes, they're the ones that are pregnant. But then usually they have a partner in this and there's two parents, usually, sometimes. Um, And I kind of wonder, you know, why is it only that female-bodied individuals are having these thoughts and why are we seeing the trends so starkly different between female body individuals and men? And, you know, where, where is that divide? Because at the end of the day, both, you know, men and women are both parents and why why do we feel an extra responsibility as the mom? Yes, this. It's so interesting to me. I feel this so much with the whole concept of mom guilt, which I hate the phrase mom guilt because there's no dad guilt and uh, it's not a thing. And I feel terrible if I stay late at work and get home late um, because. I'm responsible for getting dinner on the table and, you know, all these other things. And there's, there are all these other responsibilities and this burden that we take on as the mother or as the female role. And I think there's, there's something to be said about, about roles in a relationship. You know, we, like my husband and I have pretty defined roles in that I do all the food stuff. He does all, he does every, literally everything else. Um, and so he still probably does more than I do. And I'm really lucky in that sense. Um, but we've had to kind of work that out and decide who's going to do what. And it's been kind of a natural division of labor, but there are a lot of societal cultural norms and expectations that we're up against as women, because those were all established when you were for, for stay at home moms. And you just can't do it if you're working outside the home. Like You just can't. There's not enough time in the day to do all the things. And so if you are holding yourself to that standard, you're going to be completely crushed with guilt and stress and anxiety because you're not going to, you can't do it. You can't have a full-time job outside of the home and then also be a full-time homemaker. Like you just can't. And so that's the, the, issue that we're fighting right now, I think, is that society and, and cultural standards still expect us to function like a full-time homemaker, but then have a job outside of the home. And so I work really hard to let go of the guilt and and not feel guilty at all. You know, my husband will go golfing if he like has some extra time. And sometimes I'm like, I can't even imagine like having the luxury to go golfing in my extra time, I'm like cooking or doing house stuff or whatever. And I've had to really actively try to fight against that and say, no, I'm going to go home and I'm going to go for a run. And I'm not going to see the kids for 30 minutes because I'm going to go for a run and I'm not going to feel guilty about it. And this is important to me. And my husband wouldn't feel guilty about it. You know, I, it's, it's just, it, we shouldn't have to have these men, this mental load, but we do. And I think the best thing is talking about it, changing these standards, making it okay, and and feeling validated for what we're all going through. Because it's crazy and it's really hard. And there's no right way. I mean, I can share the stuff that, that I do that makes it work, but there's no right way to do it. I totally appreciate that. I think the default is that the woman does does everything. You know, my mom did everything. She was super mom. She worked. She did the kids. And it's a hard standard to set. And the fact that it is the default, you know, that's the problem. It really should be a joint partnership. And I'm curious, 
can you share any tips and tricks that you have with your partner? Now we're talking about, you know, heteronormative relationship, but there's lots of different relationships, no matter the gender, but between your partnership with your husband, how do you decide to share the responsibilities of parenthood? So I think this has to happen for every couple. You have to figure out how it's going to work for you. And my advice for people would be to decide what you like to do and what you're good at doing. If you like to do it and you're good at doing it, you should 100% be doing those things. If you don't like to do it and you have the means to not do it, either your partner likes to do it or you can outsource it, do not do it. If you're in medicine, we're all working so, so hard. So if you don't enjoy doing something, like I do not like laundry. I do not like laundry. And so I do not do laundry, like period. I just don't. I have a hard rule. Andrea doesn't do laundry. Nope. And my husband doesn't mind doing his laundry. So he does his laundry. And then I have our wonderful housekeeper and our nanny do my laundry. And he doesn't want anybody else to do his laundry. And so he doesn't have to, and that's fine. So you just have to figure out what works for you. So here's another example. I love to cook. I love food. We have a giant garden and I love to garden. And this is my passion and my hobby. And I spend extra time doing it. And so I do all the cooking and it it fills my cup and I enjoy it. And so that's not something that I outsource. But if you don't like cooking, you 100% outsource that. In the terms of like being a super mom land, our kids have adorable clothes. We've gotten a ton of amazing hand-me-down clothes from my husband's sisters and our nanny who's amazing. Her kids are just a little bit older. So we get all these hand-me-down clothes. Um, And I do not have the time or mental effort or energy to keep my kids closet or clothes organized. And I have no idea what clothes came from where my kids are dressed. And like, I have no clue what, who are these clothes from? Did we buy these? Did somebody give these to us? Like, no, I have no idea. And, um, for a minute, I felt bad about that because my mother-in-law came and was like, Oh, where, you know, where do you keep the onesies? I was like, I have no idea. I, I do not organize my kids closet. Our nanny is an angel and I've put her completely in charge of the kids clothes. And for, for literally 30 seconds, I felt a little bit guilty, like, oh, I'm such a bad mom because I don't, I don't personally pick out the outfits and have my kids closet organized. And then I thought, you know, that is so dumb. I do so many things. I spend so much time with my kids and organizing their clothes and keeping their closet all t- together is not something I'm going to do. I'm not going to waste the mental capacity to decide like what outfits go together for my two-year-old. I'm just not going to do it. So you have to decide what you want to do and what your partner wants to do. And if there's things that neither of you want to do and you have the means to outsource it, 100, it's so worth the money. My husband's very frugal and I had to force him to let us get a housekeeper. Um, And it's so, so worth it because you just have to remember how valuable your time is and, and what's money if it's not buying you time, you know, that's the most important thing in our life. And so even if it's not perfectly in your budget, I would say your splurge should be on outsourcing things like a housekeeper or laundry or whatever to buy you back that time. And that's how I've conceptualized it. So I do the things that I like and anything that I don't like to do, my husband does it. And if he doesn't like to do it, then we outsource it. It's so helpful to hear you talk that out in such detail. Also, I really think the detail matters. Um, And anybody who's listening, I was imagining also, I loved the way you were specific, Dr. Tooley. And also, I really appreciate how you, um, you really, I think you modeled something really great. You modeled how you talk to yourself. And I think the, the inner voice that we all have is such a critical one. Like, I don't know anyone. It's not a natural thing for some reason to have Um, an uplifting inner voice. Our inner voice tends to be a critical one (laughs) and it tends to make us do things like feel guilty or feel bad about, I'm not good enough. I don't do enough. I'm, you know, whether it's my, my doctor role or my parent role or whatever role it is. And so I just really loved hearing you talk that out and say, yes, I am. I am good enough. I am a good mom. And just because I don't want to do laundry, that doesn't affect my sense of self. I just Again, I'll, I'm going to replay this tape and listen to that part again, because I think you modeled it wonderfully. Uh, learning to talk to ourselves in a way that's positive and not 
guilt provoking or um, undermining who we, we want to be. I think it's just wonderful. Uh, and, and I know your kids will pick up on that too. As they grow up, they'll hear that as well. Um, just to shift a little bit on just, you were talking about, you know, being a mom and being a doctor, these are two big, big identities of your yourself, your sense of self. Can you talk a little bit about how becoming a mom has actually changed your own perspective on what being a doctor is and what it means to you to be a doctor? I think it's changed so much. I think I really grew up when I became a mom. It was a, just a complete identity change um, where, and, and it all kind of happened right at that same time where you're transitioning from trainee to attending. And then, and then, so in the doctor life, you're going through that personal change. I had been on faculty for a year. It's like, oh, these are my patients and this is my clinic and I'm the attending. It's a huge change um, professionally. And then going from being a kid, being a, a resident, a fellow, you know, a junior, and then having, and then having your own babies to take care of, uh, you just grow up right away. And uh, I think it helped me gain a new kind of deeper maturity um, that I just didn't have before. I think it also really helped me um, connect and empathize with other parents that I just did not understand. You, it's, and unless you've been around kids and you have a very close um, observational status of what it's like to be a parent, I just didn't understand at all what it meant to be a parent. The stress, the um, concern that you have for this little life and the, the new level of busyness that you take on, it's just all consuming. I think it really helped me connect to my patients who are parents, um, especially when my patients are, are young children. It's so much harder for me now to see kids going under anesthesia or see kids with any kind of trauma. It just, everything hits different when you're a parent. Um, and, and then it really helped me connect with our trainees who are moms um, or our parents, but especially the moms who are trainees, because when you're breastfeeding, when you're up all night and then, and you're also a resident, it is not easy. And I've had it about as easy as you can have it. I had a really nice recovery. I had as long of a maternity leave as I wanted. I came back on faculty and I have an office with a refrigerator. I have my pump right here so I can leave. They block clinic for me. So I have a little 30 minute block in the day where I can go and pump and store my milk in my fridge. You know, it's just basically as ideal as it could be. And then you see residents who are on the wards and running around and there's no good place to pump and you have to bring your pump in a bag and then how are you going to keep your milk cold and well maybe you can't leave rounds right now and so you have to push it out an hour or 30 minutes and then you haven't pumped enough for the day and then you're stressed because you are worried about your supply because your baby at home you needs a slightly bigger bottle and you're getting texted that you're out of milk and it's unbelievable the stress and pressure that we go through raising littles. And uh, I cannot imagine doing it as a trainee. And um, I just applaud trainees who do it. It's, it's incredible. And I'll, all I want to do is support our trainees. We, we have usually about a resident a year who has a baby. And it's really remarkable that we have in, outstanding doctors, outstanding surgeons and clinicians that are at the same time balancing breastfeeding or just being up all night with a little one who won't sleep or just being worried about daycare and are they okay and maybe they're sick today. There's just so much. You you can't understand how much is happening in the back of your mind when you're a parent. When um, when you don't have kids, you don't understand that. And so I, I really connect with the trainees who are parents so much more than I ever could. You know, I thought I was supportive and I was the associate residency product a program director. I'm the associate PD right now, but I'm going to take over as residency program director in July. And I'm just so glad that now I get it. I really get it. And all I want to do is support our residents who have kids at home, um, the moms and the dads. We've had a couple dads this year who've taken off six weeks for paternity leave, which is wonderful. 
and and all I want to do is encourage that. Thank you so much for sharing. Really, all of a lot of the difficulties with having kiddos at home, the difficulties of fitting in breastfeeding with a full work schedule. I think these are a lot of the things that people are thinking about when they're thinking about starting a family. I want to share a finding from a systematic review published in 2020 by Medical Journal of Australia. It's titled Motherhood and Medicine and is a systematic review of experiences of mothers who are doctors. One study found that many women reported prioritizing their careers, including completion of specialty training, by choosing to delay having children. Another study found that 64% of respondents deferred having children for career reasons, while other studies also found that women were delaying having a family to attain specific career goals. For example, this review found that female surgeons in the United States were twice as likely as male surgeons to delay having children until after postgraduate residency training. Dr. Tooley, at any point did you consider delaying motherhood? Yeah, I'm not, I believe these statistics. So I didn't, but like I said earlier, that's really because I was not in the headspace. I was, I, I had kids the second I decided that I wanted to have kids. Um, and, but I absolutely can understand why people would want to delay. And when I think retrospectively, would I have been able to do the training program that I did with kids? You know, I did fellowship in New York City. We were running around multi-institutional, middle of the night, all over the place. Um, it was the greatest fellowship, best experience. We have had fellows in my fellowship who've had kids, but I, I do not know how they did it. I cannot imagine having done my fellowship with little kids. And so... Um, I completely understand people thinking they need to delay. And here's what I want to say to that. The culture is changing. Programs are becoming more receptive. And you cannot choose. I mean, I, I personally think that having a family and your family is the biggest priority. It's the most important thing. Medicine can wait. You, are, you owe medicine nothing. And so if you delay and, and then have fertility struggles, that's not something I would wish on anyone. And so I would encourage anyone who wants children to have them when you're ready and do not worry about medicine. Medicine will wait for you. You will be an amazing surgeon and, and clinician with kids. It's completely fine. Programs are becoming more and more adaptive and receptive, and the programs that aren't supportive of families are um, are really getting a rude awakening and 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 starting to realize that you cannot do that anymore. It, we live in a completely different culture. It used to be that all the residents were male and they all had a stay-at-home wife who would take care of the kids, and that's a completely different model. And that's how medicine is still kind of in that model and that framework. And that's just not true anymore. We have more women going into medicine than we have men. And so things are going to change. They are changing. Our, our residency program, really all of the Mayo residency programs are so, so accepting. Um, and I think are, are very uh, good, healthy environments for people to have children. We have an eight week maternity leave policy for all of our trainees, which I think is very generous and is great you know, you have to balance, you still have to learn and you have to, you have to put in the hours. Medicine is hard. It's not easy. You can't cut, cut it short. There's still a lot you have to learn. So it's still going to be hard, but you, you can do it. You can make it work. And I would not delay having kids just because fertility struggles are so difficult. They're hard on your body. They're hard mentally. They're emotionally taxing. And you're going to be missing all your, all your training to go to all your fertility appointments. And so if you're worried about missing training and so you're delaying child, like it's going to catch up to you one way or another. So anyways, my point is, um, please don't delay or don't think you have to. I love it when our applicants come through every year and they say, is your program friendly to having kids? What's it like breastfeeding in your program? I don't think you should be afraid to ask those questions. You know, historically people would say, oh my gosh, never 
say that you have kids when you're interviewing, like don't tell a residency program that you have kids. That's not the case anymore. I think you should be open about it. And if you're thinking about having kids during residency, say, I, I, I'm i thinking about having a baby during residency. What would that look like at your program? How long would my maternity leave be? Would I have to extend my residency? Have you had residents do it before? Can I talk to them? What was it like for them? Like you, if If a program doesn't want you because of that, that wasn't the right program for you. So I really would encourage everyone, don't delay. Be honest and open about it if you're thinking about about having kids in residency um, and have kids in med school. That's probably the best time, but you you have to do what's right for you and your family. That's wonderful advice. I was thinking um, of one of my very close friends from residency who did have, she has three boys uh, and they're all pretty grown up by now, but her first child was in medical school. Her second one was when she was an intern, and her third one, I think, was yeah, toward the end of residency or maybe just right after. But when I think about what she went through, um, and she's told me some stories, I'm just in awe of uh, what you said. You're living all these other lives while living your own. Your mind is always in each of your children. Is she okay? Is he okay? What's happening now? Somebody had a a cut? Is it infected? It was looking bad this morning while you're in the operating room or while you're, you know, seeing patients in clinic. And so to have your heart, it's, it's been said that having children is like having your heart walk around outside of your body and you have multiple hearts walking around yes. and it's really hard to keep track of all that and maintain your own sense of balance. Um, so I'm just in awe of anyone who is a parent uh, during their training uh, and even really honestly during your career, it's all, it's medicine is a very difficult career too. And so it's never easy. Um, do you have any, you, you did share some very wonderful practical tips. Do you have any other um, overall tips about balance um, between career education, training slash career uh, and having young ones, littles at home? Uh, what kinds of overall other advice that you could give that's helpful? I'll, t- I'll try to give my advice. I've, I feel like I kind of took the easy way out because I didn't have babies in training. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage you guys to, to do another podcast with somebody who had babies while they were in training, because I can't, I'm not going to pretend like it was that hard for me. I've been so lucky as faculty. I've had all the support and I think it would be much harder to find balance when you're a trainee, because when you're a resident, when you're a fellow, your time doesn't belong to you. You're still, your priority, your full-time job is learning and being a trainee and and you have to be available. You have to be able to go in at the middle of the night. You don't want to feel like something's pulling you from your learning where you can't really invest your all because these are the the four or five years of your life where you want to invest everything into your training. And so I think finding the balance there would be really hard and you would need backup after backup after backup and layers of support to know that your kids are okay. Um, And then you are going to have to do a lot of internal work to to help yourself cope with guilt or feeling sad about missing out on times because you are, you're going to, you're going to miss stuff. Um, And it's going to be harder on you than it is on your kids. I think people have said that to me so many times, you know, when I miss little things with the kids, they're like, they're fine. They're having a blast. They're with the nanny's kids. They're having a great time. They're with dad. They're having a wonderful time. Like every, it's it's harder on me than it is on them. Um, but in terms of finding balance now as faculty with all the support and, and the resources that I have, I have drawn a pretty hard line between being at home and being at work. I work really hard when I'm at work and I try to be super efficient and I have every day to do's that try to keep me really focused. Like today I got to review this manuscript because I still do a lot of research and I publish a lot and I'm on committees, I do all this stuff. So it's like today I got to do X, Y, and Z. Um, And then as soon as I go home, I am offline. I I don't have my work email on my phone. I don't check my work email. I am not available and I don't, I don't do notes at home. I don't do anything. I'm 100% with my kids. Um, And, and that I, that recharges me and I, I need that time and I'm not good at 
at kind of splitting and I, I don't know that like that's just what works for me I'm not saying that that's what everybody has to do if you want to go home and put the kids to bed and then do your notes after the kids go to bed and that works for you then you should do that but for me I've just decided when I'm home I don't do any work at home and I don't feel bad about it I don't respond to people's emails at 7 p.m. and I would never expect anybody else to respond to me at 7 p.m. like when you're home I'm not going to bother you and I'm really trying to change the culture of evening meetings. We have a lot of committee meetings at 7 p.m. And I'm telling you, 7 p.m. is the hardest time when you have littles because they have bedtime. It's like bath time and bedtime. And if I'm on this big committee meeting where I have to look all professional on Zoom, it's not, it's not easy. So I hope that we can change that and have more meetings that are conducive to people who have little kids. Um, so that's that's kind of how I find balance at home. The kids wake up at 7 or 7.30 in the morning and I'm already gone for work. And so I try to leave a little earlier for work and get to work extra early. And I do my extra work in the morning because I that wouldn't be kid time anyway. They're asleep anyway. Um, and so if I leave at 6 a.m. versus if I leave at 7 a.m., they're still asleep. So that's helped me get a little extra work done um, and, and fit that in with commitments and things. Um, and then, and then I w try to kind of work things out with my husband. Fridays are my big OR days and I'm always late on Fridays. Um, I have like big, big cases. I'm at the main hospital. Um, so I do all my general anesthesia cases and like big combo cases with neurosurgery. Like Fridays are just big stressful days for me. And so when I came back from my second maternity leave, I told my husband, I can't do dinner on Fridays. I need you to be in charge of dinner on Fridays. And I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's takeout. I don't care if it's leftovers. I like nothing matters, but I need to know that it is that it is not my problem. And he was like, yeah, sure, of course. And so Fridays, I don't do dinner. Like we, there's just little things. It's all a work in progress. You have to figure out what works for you. I think it's really pays to be introspective and reflective and kind of take take account of how things are going. And if things aren't going well, then reevaluate and fix it. You know, I don't don't just slog through the badness. Um, that that's something that has really helped me. I'm always trying to figure out little tweaks and things I can change and optimize to get the balance better because it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be 100 percent. But I feel like right now I'm in a good place. Then the kids will get a little bit older and we'll have to change everything and it'll be all different. So you gotta be adaptable and um, you have to be able to take a look at how things are going and communicate with your team. You know, whether that's grandparents who are there helping you or your spouse or your partner or whatever, I think you all have to be able to kind of adapt and figure it out. Wow, thank you so much. I really appreciate you really defining, you know, and prioritizing when you're home, you're home, when you're at work, you're working. And I just love just the reminder of like, why are you doing things you don't like to do? There's another option, which I think nobody yes. ever talks about. Yes. Um, and I love also just this description of a team, you know, who's on your team. It's not a single person or a two person game. Parenthood takes a, a whole village and so I'd love to hear you talked about outsourcing and, you know, you talked about the different people in your life, your housekeeper, nanny. Are there anyone else on your team, your village that helps you and your husband take care of the kids? We have a really great system. So our nanny is is absolutely outstanding. She takes care of all the kids stuff. Um, she she really is almost kind of a house manager. The other day she texted me and said, you know, I really think you should get some stuff for the front porch. We need like a big umbrella because it's too sunny out there for the kids. And we need a rug because it's slippery. And we should get like a big basket to keep all their toys in that can be outside. And and I texted her back and said, I hope this doesn't offend you, but I would so it would be so much more helpful to me if you would just order it. Like she sent me a link with all these rug options. And and I was like, I love you, but the last thing I want to do is pick out a rug. Like you just pick it out and we will get it. And, um, and that works for me, you know? So she's almost the house manager where I'm just like, whatever you need, that's great. Just send, just send me the link and I'll order it. But I don't want to have to decide which rug to get. Um, so, so that 
And then we have our housekeeper who does a lot of, she does all my laundry, she does dishes and keeps the house clean, but she also does some organizational stuff for us. So I'll say like, can you fix the mudroom? Like it's a disaster and the, the cabinets need to be reorganized or maybe we need some more baskets to put stuff or whatever. So I've really empowered her to kind of reorganize stuff. Last week, she completely redid our fridge and just like moved everything around and our fridge is beautiful. So I've, so she kind of does all the housekeeping stuff and she comes once a week. I found her on our um, little town Facebook page. We live in like a little town outside of Rochester and I just post on the Facebook page and was like, I'm looking for a housekeeper who will do not just the basic cleaning stuff, but some organizational stuff. And a bunch of people commented and was like, this person, this person. So that's a good tip. If you need some help, there's always like group Facebook pages. Uh, I found a lot of, a lot of good stuff from there. It's, it's um, unfortunate that our in-laws and my parents don't live close, but they, they're about a 10 hour drive. And so they come up when we need them. Uh, and then we also have really outstanding neighbors, our whole neighborhood. We live out in the middle of nowhere on a gravel road in a kind of country community. We live on 16 acres and all of our neighbors have like horses and chickens and, and it's like this little country community. So our neighbor will like come over in their tractor. Um, but it's so great because they all, we're all like help, helping each other. My husband's always borrowing stuff and something breaks down or our driveway needs plowed or our chickens need to be watched or whatever. Um, we have a really nice neighborhood. So that's been wonderful too and, and enriching to have friends that live around you. So that's kind of our village. Um, we don't have a ton of backup for our nanny and we're, as the kids are getting a little older, we're starting to realize that we probably need some kind of backup. Our nanny's parents are, are almost our backup because if she can't take care of her kids, her parents will, and they're going to take care of our kids too. <laughs> um, so you kind of have to just build that and decide. But my big tip is to look on Facebook if you need some kind of outsourcing. There's there's local chefs who will cook for you. I have a couple girlfriends. I have one girlfriend who has a local um, Indian woman who makes like traditional Indian cuisine for them because they're an Indian family and they want to eat Indian food. And they get this fabulous like homemade Indian food once a week delivered to them. So you can go on a Facebook page and say, I'm looking for somebody who will cook for us or grocery shop for us or whatever, whatever. You, you know, you can find somebody to do anything you need. Um, Dr. Tilly, I, I love that you shared those. Those are really helpful, helpful bits. Um, you live in Minnesota, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a feeling, and we can edit this out. <laughs> we don't need this to be part of the podcast. But I have a feeling that your life in Minnesota is, and, and how safe you might feel among people that you ask to do things for you is different than, for example, living in San Francisco. And I have some friends who have new baby right now. And for them, the finding of a man, I think you're so lucky uh, and I'm really grateful yeah. that that's your experience right now, that you have such an amazing nanny and such an amazing team and neighbors. I think it really is dependent on where you live because the safety of certain places, cities and such in, in America are are real different uh, in, you know, lo locations make some difference in who you can trust these days, I guess. But oh, I didn't mean for that to be yeah. in our podcast. We can certainly edit that out. But I love that that's your experience. And I'm really happy. that it That's been. such a good point and something I didn't even consider. And you're absolutely right. That, that would be really hard. You know, when we were finding our nanny, we wanted her to be somebody that we knew um, or that was recommended by a friend or somehow had some connection. Right. Some people had recommended that we look on care.com or, you know, like some other of these nanny sources where there's um, services where you can find a nanny. And we didn't feel comfortable with that. We wanted somebody that we kind of knew. Mm -hmm. And we ended up, we were so lucky that we ended up finding somebody um, who's now like family, um, but she she's the daughter of, of one of our scrub techs that had worked for us for 30 years and was my mentor's scrub tech for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And it's her daughter. And when I joined the faculty, sh she said, are you looking for a nanny? Because my daughter needs a job. And it just ended up being perfect. Um, but but mm -hmm. I, I completely hear what you're saying. And we felt that too. We didn't mm -hmm. really trust just someone that we had no connection to. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a, that's wonderful. It's great to hear that. Yeah. And how lucky you are. That's awesome. You've talked a lot about these wonderful sources of support and strength that you have in your life and in your family and in your career. And I'm wondering if there have been times when you have not felt so much supported in your journey to build your career 
while you were building a family? And, and also, what advice do you have for people that might have the challenges of not feeling supported at times in their careers? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. I really have been extremely fortunate that I've had a very supportive department, very supportive mentors, and I have not experienced much negative. Um, but I'll tell you some fears that I had about not being supported. I, ha I took on this big committee role um, right when I had my second baby and it involved quite a bit of travel. And I had traveled early when I had my daughter. When I had Tessa, I had traveled right away and really regretted traveling without her. It's when you're trying to establish breastfeeding and when you're new um, and pumping like around the clock and just traveling in those early months is really hard to travel without your baby. And I did. I left Tessa when she was six weeks to go take my oral board exam for oculoplastic surgery. And um, I, anyways, I regretted doing that. And so when I had Dawson, my son, I had a couple conferences and, and meetings that I needed to go to. And I said, I'm just going to bring him. And um, he was like 12 weeks, you know, three months old, still little baby. And I was really nervous. I took him to lead a retreat where I was the new committee chair, and I thought this could go really bad, um, where, you know, if he's crying or disruptive or whatever, they're going to think, who is this girl who's new chair of the committee is a mess and brings her baby and just can't, is not so unprofessional. I just really was worried. And then that committee meeting immediately was followed by our academic meeting for program directors and department chairs. And there's a 200 people there. It's a big meeting. And, and I kept, and I stayed out there with my baby for both of these meetings back to back. It was an eight day trip and I wasn't going to leave him for eight days. And I was really worried about that too, because it's all department chairs. So it's like, it's like old, you know, senior career people who I thought they're gonna see me coming in with a stroller into these conferences with my baby and be like, what is this? You know, get this girl out of here. So I was really fearful. And um, what I'll say is that it was a really fantastic experience and I've never felt more supported by everyone, even these old white guys who I thought for sure would roll their eyes, just came up to me one by one and said, this is fantastic. We should have more babies at conferences. I'm so glad you came because that was the option. It's like, I'm either going to not come or I'm going to come and bring my baby. And so if you want young, young doctors to be engaged, to be engaged in medicine at a high level, then you have to support us bringing our families along because we are in the early stages of our career and we're building our families. And so you can't have it both ways. I'm either not going to go to the meeting or I'm going to bring my newborn. And, um, and it really just went splendidly. And I don't mean to be so Pollyanna and just like everything is great, but I hope that I can encourage other people who might think, um, oh, I could never go to that conference because I, I don't want to be away from my baby or whatever. Just bring them. I baby wore, I wore Dawson through the whole thing. And it was great and it was totally fine. And I was really nervous that I would be seen as unprofessional or you know, seen in some other way. And then ironically, I had another meeting a couple months later um, that I wasn't the chair of the committee. I was a guest. It was a small meeting and I didn't bring my baby because I felt really uncomfortable. Like, ooh, I'm a guest at this meeting. Like, I just don't think it'd be appropriate to, should be the one showing up with the kid and you know whatever it was a, it was a two day very quick down and back thing so i thought oh i'll just leave him at home and then when i got there everyone kept asking me why didn't you bring your baby <laughs> and so they were all hoping that i would and um and so that really was an eye opener for me like wow i like this is okay and so um, I think if you're fearful that you're not going to be supported, you might end up being surprised and you might actually be more supported than you think. And so I would charge 
every, all young parents to boldly bring your children along and be engaged in your career and don't feel like you have to shy away from being engaged, doing those presentations, being on those committee leadership roles, showcasing your research, whatever, um, that enriches your career. It, it makes your career more fulfilling and you can blend it with your family. You really can. Ah, oh, thank you so much for sharing. I love that. A, uh, an act. Everyone should uh, boldly bring their children where children have not gone before. So yes. <laughs> I love that call to action. I actually have noticed recently in our residency conferences, whether it be faculty or residents, bringing their kids along. And I definitely appreciate you normalizing the experience. And I definitely think it's a wonderful thing to do and people should keep doing it. And um, just to segue a little bit, even with all of your obligations, um, you have become an important voice in ophthalmology and a voice that has reached so many. Can you tell us a little bit about what made you decide to make social media a part of your career? Yeah, thanks. You know, I've been doing social media forever. I started a blog the day after I took step one, back when blogs were cool. And I blogged all through third year of medical school. I blogged about all my clerkships and what it was like being a med student back when nobody was blogging. And I think the only reason I gained any traction is because there was nobody doing it. It was, you know, that was 14 years ago when um, there just weren't a lot of med students online. I started making YouTube videos about medicine and how to study and what it's like being a resident or what it's like being in different subspecialties. And those gained a lot of traction, really it just because there was such a lack of information out there at that time. It's such a different place now. You know, there's all these incredible medical students online, residents online sharing their, their journey and what it's like, which I think is wonderful because I think it's encouraging more young people to choose a career in medicine, which I mean, I think medicine is the greatest and I would choose it over and over again. And so I love that we can get a glimpse into what it's like and so that we can really recruit the best the best people because um, ultimately that that's going to be the best thing for our patients get the best doctors we can take the best care of we have tons of people who need great care and we need all different faces and colors and shapes and sizes and everybody and so anyways i love social media because i think it really does help people get into medicine and I, I've just kind of transitioned my social media to just showcasing my life as a resident and as a fellow, now as an early attending and a mom. And I just like sharing what I'm doing and I don't put too much pressure on it or, or put a bunch of goals or anything that I have to do because frankly, I don't have the, the time or the energy to care about it that much. But I love connecting with people and I love meeting um, students and people who are interested in ophthalmology or interested in medicine. Um, or I learn so much. I get so much out of the people that I follow and even trainees that I follow, I learn so much. And so really it's enriched my life very, very much. And I think that it's a positive thing in the pre-med and medical education space. I think it's a way for doctors to educate patients directly. We can communicate with our patients and we can put out um, what's good and good information. I think we saw that with COVID. There were so many doctors on social media just putting out great information, fighting misinformation. It's such an interesting landscape that we're in right now. And it's a way for doctors to have a voice. And so I think that I think doctors should be on social media and should be reaching our patients because that's where our patients are. And if we're not there, they're going to get the information from somebody else. And so I, I really enjoy social media and I think it's great. I totally appreciate that. And in the beginning, we kind of talked about how personally, you know, balancing the podcast, balancing intern year, it can be a struggle. Do you have any advice for how you balance your time, career, family, and social media? It's really hard and it ebbs and flows and you'll have times that are super busy and times that are more relaxed. What works for me is um, I'm a very like daily planner type person. I can make a whole week plan, but then I never stick to it. 
Um, I'm, I'm more of like a, what am I going to do in the next few hours type of person? So I tend to make lots of lists. Um, like I have a, I'll show you right here. I have a giant to-do list. Um, and anytime I have a free moment, I look at the list and decide something that I'm going to do. But I try most days to say like, these are the one or two things that I have to do today. So it's like today I have to finalize this plan for this committee. I have to send out this email and I have to finish, you know, th these notes on Epic or, or whatever. And so for you, Nicole, it might be like, I have to finish this chapter. I have to do this, this many review questions and I have to finalize this podcast invitation or whatever. And then you say, it doesn't matter what else I do that day, but as long as I do those three things, then it's been a successful day. But I think being intentional about your time is what's most important because when you're busy and you have a million things to do, it gets so easy to like spin your wheels and not really get anywhere. So I try to be super intentional about, you know, it's like I can be on Instagram and scrolling and wasting my time all day, but as long as I do these two things, then I've made some progress. Uh, and so I don't put a ton of pressure on myself, but just really kind of keeping track of, of what you need to do, making small goals for yourself are ways to kind of keep, keep it in motion. That's what's worked for me at least. That's awesome. Um, I'm a list maker as well, and I have papers all over. I'm not sure I get them all done, but I, I do like to make the list so I can see what has to be done and hopefully do it. <laughs> and Dr. Tooley, as we wrap up this really wonderful interview with you, um, I wanted to ask what advice you have for, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me see how we phrased our question this time. Nicole, hold on one second. Please forgive me. Give me one moment. My screen just froze. Yeah. What, uh, I wanted to ask what advice you have for um, either people in medical school, residency, fellowship, or even who are attendings now. How can they work to balance medicine and motherhood? Or we can be more broad, medicine and parenthood. Well, you're, you're never going to feel like you have a complete balance. I've learned that for sure. There's going to be times where you're more focused on medicine and times where you're more focused on motherhood. Um, but gosh, I, there, there's no good answer to this question. It's, I think what I'm going to, what I'm going to say is that you have to find the individual system that works for you. For me, it works to come to work early and work my butt off all day long trying to edit manuscripts or mentor students or record podcasts or, you know, do committee leadership things that I really like and then see my patients all day or do surgery all day and then try to book it out of there as soon as I can so that I'm home by, you know, five. 4.30 or 5 so that I have two and a half or three hours to just play nonstop with my kids. Go immediately go outside and play. Immediately, if it's cold, go in the basement and play and have focused, uninterrupted two hours with my kids. Have a wholesome meal on the table that's food that we've grown, food that I've cooked that makes my soul happy. And then put the sweet babies to bed, kind of tidy up the kitchen and spend a little bit of time with my husband, go out to the garden in the in the kind of dusk or dim light. That's what we're doing now. Um, and then go to bed and do it all over again. And that's what is balanced for me. That makes me feel immensely happy and satisfied. I love my job. I love, love being an oculoplastic surgeon. I love my patients. Um, and I love being a mom. I love my kids. I love playing with them and being home with them. And, and Honestly, being home and playing with them for two uninterrupted hours feels like enough. It feels good. I don't feel like I need to spend eight hours a day with them to, to have that relationship. Like I feel great having two or three hours and sitting at the dinner table um, with my one and a half year old. You know, I have little kids. This could all change when they're bigger. And so right now in this phase of life, in this early career where I want to say yes to all the research opportunities. I want to say yes to all the committee opportunities. Um, and then I want to be really engaged at home. That's how it's working for me right now. And it's all subject to change. Right. And I'm totally cool with that. It, like maybe we'll have more kids and it'll all explode. 
and I'll come back and say, forget everything I said. It's a disaster. Just try to survive. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Or maybe the kids will, when they're five and six, it'll look totally different because they'll be after school activities or when they're 10 and 11, we'll be trying to run to ball games or like, I have no idea what the future holds, but this is what I'm doing right now. I love my job. I love my home life. I love my passions. I love my husband. Like, it's just great. Everything is so great. So I'm here to tell you that you can have young kids and crush it in medicine and really love your job and find a ton of fulfillment on both sides. And are there times where it's stressful and I totally lose it and fall apart? Yeah, of course. But for the most part, is it great? Yes. And it's totally worth it. So just do it. Thank you so much for this incredible interview. We just feel so lucky to have you on, learn from you, and we're excited to share your story with our listeners. Thanks again. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tooley. And people can look you up on your website, uh, andreatooley.com, right? A-N-D-R-E-A-T-O-O-L-E-Y.com. Correct? Right. Yep, you got it. That's my old blog. You can find some really old posts there from back when I was a resident um, and fellow. There's some fun, funny stuff there. And then I'm most active day to day on my Instagram, which is Dr. Andrea Tooley. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Tooley. What a joy it's been.